mirror mirror on the wall what is the best brand for my balls manscaped of course hold up is that a nose pube we got in there? Good thing our partners at Manscaped are here to help ensure that you're taking care of your manhood and your nose hairs with their new performance package. I have I have a few long nose hairs here and there, and uh, they're kind of hard to deal with sometimes. You don't want to pull them out. That's kind of gross, right? Well, luckily, Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Included in the new package is the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, which is waterproof and uses a 9 thousand rpm motor fitted to a 360 degree rotary dual blade system this nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology which helps prevent nicks snags and tugs up inside your nose it's a sensitive spot you don't want to you don't want to mess it up look guys 79 percent of partners polled admitted that long nose hairs are a major turn off why not use the best tools on the job? Uh, their new bundle also includes the Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer, the best hair trimmer for your balls ever. You guys have heard me talk a ton about this thing. Let's not forget their famous liquid formulations either. You got the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner to maximize your ball hygiene routine. You gotta have a routine in there, okay? Get the performance package now and receive two free gifts, Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Also, you're going to receive a replaceable blade every three months to keep your weed whacking and lawn mowing time clean and enjoyable. It's awesome. The performance package is the best value that Manscaped has to offer. Get 20% off and free shipping with code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code GAS20. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weeds. Thank you, Manscaped, for making our holes look sexy. Oh, wow. <laughs> Race you to the top. It's one of the fundamental challenges we humans like to throw at each other. In motorsports, racing to the top is better known as hill climbing. It's a discipline nearly as old as cars themselves. The first ever documented hill climb occurring at La Turbie in France on January 31st, 1897. There are hill climbs in England including the Shelsley Climb, which has been running since 1905, New Zealand, the Alps, and East Africa. Wherever there are mountains, drivers race to the top. However, within the sport, there's one hill, a mountain, more accurately, that towers above them all. The Super Bowl of Knowles, the World Cup of driving up. Forget the Indy 500. This is the Colorado 14,000 feet, the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb. Known as the Race to the Clouds, Pikes Peak is the premier event in the sport of hill climbing. Since its inception in 1916, it's been an ever-evolving race that served as a reflection of every era of the automobile. In the open division, you can drive essentially whatever you want, as long as it gets you to the top the fastest, an open invitation for innovation. So how did Pikes Peak popularize, then revolutionize the hill climb? What makes the course so special? Who are its most memorable racers? Hint, one of them is a French lady whose name rhymes with Rochelle Crouton. All of that and more on today's Past Gas. Race you up to the top in three, two, one, go. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. Go and go we will. That intro was great. I feel like I'm at church. <laughs> <laughs> like in a good way. Well, this does come out on a Sunday, so Ooh, welcome. is it church? Welcome to car church. Hunk, hunk, hunk. <laughs> There's, uh, there actually is a couple car churches like in LA right now. I've driven past a couple where they pull their car up and when like the pastor on the megaphone says, amen, everyone does honk and that's, yeah, there's amen. one right, right next to Christina's house <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she wakes up with that eight o'clock in the morning on sunday, <laughs> on sunday morning yeah welcome to past gas once again my name is nolan sykes and i'm joined as always by my co-hosts james pumphrey four score and seven years ago <laughs> baby and joe weber what's up wink wink nation i see you there i see you. keep it juiced <laughs> God damn it. it's never not awkward <laughs> Yeah, man, this is what having a catchphrase becomes. Like, you're just like, every time you say it, you're like, who am I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, as uh, as we uh, hinted or uh, even declared in our intro today, we're talking about the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, 
one of the most legendary motorsporting events in the world, something that I would like to go to one day. Uh, all the best drivers in the world compete at this race and trying to become the king or queen of the mountain. Um, what do you guys know about the the Pikes Peak International? What do you guys know? Um, I don't know a lot. I'm aware of it, I'd say. I have played with the cars in Gran Turismo. Um, right. Right, the Suzuki. We'll talk about those later this episode. I'd say that's one of the more iconic cars of the Gran Turismo franchise. Absolutely. This is definitely a huge memory from my childhood. Um, yeah, I don't know a lot about it. I know it's a wild, wild ride. I know they recently paved it. Yes. Uh, yeah. It was dirt for a long time. Um, I know a lot of times they bring out like some very experimental technologies. Yes, they do. Um, the cars are very wild looking. Um, Sounds like you know a lot about it already. <laughs> I think Volkswagen, do they have like the electric record right now? The IDR, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The eye doctor. Anything. It's called yeah. the eye doctor. <laughs> yeah, the eye doctor. It's uh, short for the optometrist. Um, goes so fast, it'll fix your vision, which is why I'm hoping my copay can cover it. Um, <laughs> no, but you're right. The, the, the Volkswagen IDR has done really well, as we'll see in this episode. I don't know too much about the actual course, but I do like just from writing so much about different people and different cars and companies and stuff. I know that like Hennessy took his like GT 3000 there or something. Uh, I know that Michelle Mouton took her Audi there. The mm -hmm. most recent one is that like the Porsche build that's all carbon fiber. Uh, I can't remember who did it, but it was like super sick car and it went, to the last Pikes Peak, and I think it did really well. But yeah, the cars are sick. They are. They are very sick. They're. Uh, imagine, dear viewer or listener, a a Group B car. At least in the the eighties and nineties, it was like a Group B car with even more aero. Nowadays, the 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 cars they bring are a lot more prototype in nature in terms of design, more swoopier shapes, not necessarily based on production cars at all. Um, but yeah, this is an iconic event in the world of motorsport. So sit back, strap yourself in, and let's go to the top. Pikes Peak is a giant among giants. It's the highest mountain in the front range of the Rocky Mountains. It is formed from billion-year-old granite. That's right, billion with a B, and was first named by the native people who lived in its shadow. They called the mountain Tava, meaning sun, and they were the Tabawatch, meaning people of Sun Mountain. In 1806, the mountain was quote unquote discovered by American explorer Lieutenant <laughs> Zebulon Pike. Jesus oh my god. This guy sounds like an alien spaceship guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Zebulon he, Pike. <laughs> he doesn't look as cool as his name suggests. I'm just going to tell you right now. Uh, he was sent by Thomas Jefferson on a mission to explore the West and upon seeing the mountain Zebulon apparently swore the mountain would never be conquered by man. Cars didn't exist yet, but it's safe to assume Pike would have included them in his assessment as well, given the chance. It only took 14 years to prove old Zebulon Pike wrong. The mountain was first scaled by a European in 1820, when Edwin James, a botanist and explorer, successfully reached the summit, collecting flowers all the way up, quote, the most notable day of the expedition for botanical collecting. Now, I don't want to give all the credit to Edwin James, although it sounds like he had a nah. great time. I'm sure that one of the tab of watch probably did it before him. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, a tab of watch got like a, a wild fire up their boot. It was just like, I'm going to climb that today. Flowers were lovely, but it was a shinier commodity that attracted the first wave of settlers to Pikes Peak. Pike's Peak or Bust was a common slogan of the Colorado Gold Rush of the 1850s, although it was more of a marketing slogan due to the prominence of the mountain. Gold wasn't discovered near Pike's Peak until mm. much later in 1893. It wouldn't be the first time that the mountain inspired the imaginations of those who climbed it. In that same year, after reaching the summit of the mountain and taking in the view, Catherine Lee Bates wrote the song America the Beautiful, describing Purple Mountain Majesties above the enameled plain. Over the years, the mountain was commonly referred to as Pike's Highest Peak before finally being simplified just to Pike's Peak. The next notable American to shape the fate of the mountain was Spencer Penrose, 
and he also might have been the one to introduce cars. Penrose had a name that sounded like the bad guy in a murder mystery, but he also had a job that would fit right into the genre. He was a mining speculator of the American West. Just like a murder mystery, Penrose had a history that could make you think he was both a suspect and a savior. He graduated from Harvard, but at the bottom of his class. Hmm. His father and brothers were doctors and lawyers. He decided to travel out west and try to make a name for himself. At first, he failed before getting a tip about some land near Cripple Creek that made him millions of dollars. And that's millions this is of dollars. Like, like in the movie, this guy is played by Walton Goggins. Oh, mm, for sure. Yeah, for sure. That's Love great that casting. Walton Goggins. Yeah. Uh, and that's millions of dollars in 1800s money, which is like a lot today. <laughs> Billions today. <laughs> I love Walton Goggins. He's so good. I feel like if I went to Harvard, I'd want to graduate at the bottom of my class. <laughs> Look, I'm I'm the best on the rowing team, but not yeah. great at socioeconomics. I mean, I went to Harvard, so I'm pretty good at stuff, but like I've partied. Penrose <laughs> settled in Colorado Springs, the closest town to Pikes Peak, where he met a woman named Julie Villiers McMillan. Although Penrose was by then in his 40s, he had sworn to stay a rich entrepreneurial bachelor but McMillan proved to be the Grimes to his Elon Musk, and the two got hitched and traveled to Europe for a lavish honeymoon. Staying at beautiful resorts around Europe inspired Penrose to murder his wife. What? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, in fact, the inspiration was to open his own motel modeled after the places he had stayed, specifically on the Mediterranean coast. This became the Broadmoor Hotel. Opened in 1918 at the cost of three million 1918 dollars, translating to a Scrooge McDuck gold coin swimming pool amount of money in today's money. The Broadmoor was and is a 779 room Italian Renaissance style palace with 18 restaurants, a golf club with three courses, including one designed by Arnold Palmer himself, and an automotive museum, the contents of which we'll soon arrive at. This thing is yeah. like massive. It looks awesome. Yeah, I want to go to the Broadmoor. Yeah, let's do it. How do you fill 700 rooms every night? That's nuts. Penrose was no fool. He knew, th he knew that to attract people to the hotel, you needed to do two things. Great reviews on TripAdvisor.com and promotional stunts. He set out to work on an ambitious project as he built the hotel. It was a $283,000 gravel and dirt road to the 14,115-foot summit of Pikes Peak with the idea of promoting tourism to the area and indirectly, his own hotel. Of course. Up, oh, I know, right? To promote the building of the Pikes Peak Highway, which was in itself intended to promote the hotel, Penrose organized a car race to the summit. It's gonna be an automobile race all the way to the top of 14,000 feet. Four wheels, one man. <laughs> That's right, this, uh, this legendary automotive event with tons of heritage and stories within it was first done to promote a hotel. 1916 was the first ever Pikes Peak Hill Climb, and by all accounts, it was a jolly good success, receiving loads of international media attention. Until that point, cars had driven up the carriage road that Penrose's highway had replaced, but not exactly at top speeds. In fact, the first automotive ascent was in 1901 when two Denver locals named Yaunt and Felker drove to the top in a two-cylinder locomobile steamer. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like... New from Taco Bell, it's the locomobile <laughs> steamer. <laughs> Eat it in your car. <laughs> uh, and they had to push that part of the way up to, uh, of the mountain. Uh, it took nine hours, which is probably slower than it would have taken to hike. Uh, and in 1916, the race was 25 to $50 to enter, with prizes ranging from $500 to $2,000, depending on the event. The all-around fastest driver would take home the aptly named Penrose Trophy, a gold and silver-plated monstrosity valued at a cool, crisp $10,000. Dang, I could take... $10,000 Renos right now. Yeah, man, for sure. Perhaps the most prominent of the drivers was Berna Barney Oldfield. 
According to Encyclopedia Britannica, his name was synonymous with speed in the first two decades of the 20th century, meaning if they ever made a need for speed set in 1916, it would be referred to as need for Barney Oldfield. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sounds Not- like a period piece <laughs> starring Kira Knightley. And uh, Tom Hardy. I'm Bernard Barney Oldfield. <laughs> I.K.A. Speed. <laughs> and then he drives away at 19 miles an hour. I do say, I think I'm in love with that man. <laughs> Oldfield actually had a pretty incredible story. He would started out as a bicycle racer before segueing to car racing after a chance meeting with Henry Ford. Ever heard of him? At this time, Ford was just starting to build cars. Oldfield raced Ford's car number 999, originating the style of sliding through turns like a motorcycle racer instead of braking, as was common practice at the time, a.k.a. friggin' drifting. This dude's the OG drift king. And this kind of foreshadows like how Michelle Mouton drove on the mountain because like, what was that the second to last turn where everyone had to slam on the brakes? She just went for it and like slid out and she used that those rally skills. Yeah. As we'll see. Uh Berna Oldfield also became known for stunts, including a so called championship of the universe series. Sick. Where he raced a fiat against a biplane which did laps around the track overhead. He was also the first driver to top a hundred miles an hour at the Indianapolis Speedway. Hell yeah. Dang. What a man. This guy <laughs> What a man, what a man, what a man, what a turn of the century, man. (laughs) Uh, As noted in a Los Angeles Times article, the first running of this annual contest over the highest highway in the world will include a Class E, which is 230 cubic inches and under, a Class C, 231 to 300 cubic inches, and a Class D, free for all for the Looney Tunes. (laughs) The latter event is for the Pence Challenge Trophy, a monstrosity valued at $10,000. The course measures 12 miles and 2,200 feet, and in order to negotiate this hill climb to the summit of the famous mountain, cars will have to conquer a rise of 6,686 feet with a maximum grade of 10.5% and an average grade of 7%. An exciting contest is assured. Hey, kids, you want an onion? (laughs) Uh, Oldenfield was driving a French Delaga automobile. Also in the field, according to the L.A. Times, two Hudsons, three Cadillacs, a Studebaker Special, a Peugeot, three Chalmers cars, and several Kings, and a number of other specials from Detroit and Indianapolis factories. The article boasted that the event promises to draw the biggest crowd that ever visited Colorado Springs. (laughs) Oh, no, the reporter just fell out of the window. (laughs) It wasn't Oldfield who distinguished himself, however. Instead, it was an unknown 22-year-old driver named Ray Lentz, the youngest in the field, who scaled the mountain in a respectable 20 minutes and 55 seconds, beating Yonk and Felker's time by 8 hours and 40 minutes. (laughs) He drove a Romano Demon Special, the smallest car in the field. Somewhat ominously, Pikes Peak official Facebook page notes that Lentz was... Never heard from again after winning. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, Dude, he just did his thing and then just got the hell out of there. He, what if he was a ghost? Oh, that's it, dude. He was a ghost. He was in hell. And yeah. the devil was like, hey, man, uh, if you want to get out of hell, you got to drive my car. The Ray <laughs> Romano <laughs> special. Uh, uh, hey, uh, it's, <laughs> Ray. Me, uh, it's me, the devil. Uh, Ray Romano. Uh. <laughs> and then Rhea was like, all right, I'll drive your car. And then he did it, and then he got to go to heaven, <laughs> yep. where he met up with Lil Peep, uh, Tupac, yep. the Pope, and freaking Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> Unfortunately, immediately after the inaugural race, the event was put on hold as World War I preoccupied the globe. Yeah, preoccupied. That's a big <laughs> <laughs> understatement. Yeah, it, it, yeah, we were preoccupied with World War One. <laughs> yeah, listen, I know I haven't uh, texted you back in a couple of days. I just, you know, like I got this world war going on. Yeah, I've been a little preoccupied. <laughs> a little with World pre- War One. Preoccupied with trench warfare. <laughs> P 
Peace and Pikes Peak would return in 1920 as the hill climb grew into an annual event. The early days of the race were rough and wild. Drivers drove with mechanics shotguns so they could fix their rig if it broke down. Shortcuts off the road were also common occurrences. Rules apparently didn't specify that you had to stay on the track. Dominant in the 1920s races was Glenn Schultz, who won the open wheel title seven times in a 10-year span. He's like the Schumacher of hill climbs. Yeah, he drove a Stutz, winning in 18 minutes, 25 seconds in 1927. Every racing event seems to create dynasties, and Pikes Peak was no different. In the 30s, a driver named Louis Unser started competing at Pikes Peak. Schultz and his Stutz and Unser would become fierce competitors at the event, with Schultz winning five times. For his part, Unser would win nine races from 1934 to 1953, kicking off an Unser family tradition that continued for decades. Yeah, the Unser name, very recognizable uh, in racing circles. Big time, big time racing family there. Yeah. After pausing for World War II, the next era of Pikes Peak was known as the IndyCar era, with the event in some years actually awarding points for the USAC IndyCar Championship. Most drivers later modified IndyCars with dirt tires and beefed up suspension. Following the cue of Rhea Lentz, cars got smaller and lighter over time as drivers realized the downside of heavy cars on a constant incline. In 1953, the Sports Car Club of America, or the SCCA, also became a sponsor as a wider range of cars began to compete in various divisions. The progression on track was relentless, with the course record getting broken every year for the next decade. In 1954, at the 32nd edition of the race, the 15-minute barrier was shattered by local Coloradan Keith Andrews. Many of the best drivers were locals who uh, were used to driving in the Rockies. In 1955, Louis Unser's nephew, Bobby Unser, debuted at Pikes Peak. Bobby, who would go on to win the Indy 500 in 1968, 75, and 81, was a fearless racer who, who'd served as a sharpshooter in the Air Force. Got to be a pretty good shot to be a sharpshooter in the Air Force. You're shooting from a plane. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Bobby had big shoes to fill when he started racing at Pikes Peak, excuse me, which some called Unser's Peak because of his uncle's success. Uncle Uncler's Peak. <laughs> <laughs> uncle Uncle Uncler's Peak? <laughs> yeah. Bobby finished fifth in his first race, which you'd think would uh, win him some family respect until he looked at the standings and realized that two of the four guys that beat him were his brothers. Uh-oh. Talk about sibling rivalry. That's an uncomfortable Thanksgiving, am I right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next year, Bobby would win his first championship, the first of 13 on the mountain. Unser pushed the course record steadily down nearly every year, from the 14 minutes to the 13s to the 12s, eventually notching a 12.05.8 in 1962 with his Unser Special. Which uh, we'll take a look at right here. I feel like the every every race car from like back in the day is called the blank special. Yeah, this is basically a sprint car. It looks like it looks like a quarter midget, maybe not a qu yeah, maybe a quarter midget with with uh, dirt tires on it. That's pretty. That's sick. Dicey, dude. Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. Yeah, imagine driving up a dirt road at speed in one of those things, <laughs> yeah. sliding around the turns. That's insane. Anyway, for much of the 50s and 60s, Bobby was the undisputed king of the hill. <laughs> By the 60s. Uh, <laughs> nice. Bobby. 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 Uh, <laughs> that boy ain't right. The, that boy ain't right. <laughs> By the 1960s, <laughs> as speeds were picking up on the mountain, proficiency with drifting became increasingly important. A 1966 film shows Bobby Unser racing in typical dry conditions, kicking up waves of dust into the faces of spectators in an indie car with no roll cage oh, inches God. away from the steeper outer edges of the track, which lacks any sort of guardrails at the same time. Eventually, pine forest gives way to barren rock as Bobby careens above the tree line, giving the high altitude upper part of the track, which is some kind, sometimes covered in clouds and otherworldly feel. In 1968, Bobby set a record that would stand for over 10 years, putting down a time of 11 minutes, 54 seconds, 0.9 in a Rizlone special. <laughs> it was a modified version of the car he'd driven to victory at the Indy 500 that same year. It's just crazy to think that he won that race in Indy and then basically drove the same car mm -hmm. to, to victory at uh, Pikes Peak. Pikes Peak was also a picturesque place for car manufacturers to show off their cars and generate advertising media. 
a tradition that continues to this day. A great example was the 1963 event when NASCAR builder Bill Strop put together a 427 cubic inch 500 horsepower Mercury Marauder USAC stock car, winning the event and breaking the record for stock cars. In 1969, Ford essentially wrote a blank check for Bobby Unser, hiring our friend, legend of the podcast, Smokey Eunuch, to build him a Boss 429 Torino. The gears alone in the transmission were purported to cost $35,000. The tires were Goodyear Pikes Peak Specials, wide and smooth on the front and deeply treaded in the rear. That's Dick. very interesting. Unser set the super stock car record of 13 minutes and 40 seconds, and it was promptly retired. According to an 80s magazine article, quote, it raced once and never turned another wheel again in any automotive competition. Meaning to this day, it's probably the most mint condition competition factory Ford car racing of that era and would uh would like to check it out YouTube channel muscle car of the week supplied many of the details on the mods that were done to the Torino specifically for Pikes Peak I've actually watched that channel many a time the car was stripped down and featured lower suspension than the street model the headlights were removed and replaced with a cold air intake the glass was replaced with plexiglass and the roll cage was installed a small wing was added to the rear for stability at higher speeds, and the rocker panels were recessed in order to fit side exhaust. Uh, and these were all becoming standard mods that drivers wanted for their cars. And um, yeah, pretty cool. I mean, this thing's definitely nice. a race car, but it it doesn't look wild at all. Like it looks I like think it's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah, like if I had, I would I would one hundred percent drive this car around. I want to give a big thank you today to our sponsor, Hawthorne. You know, I've been um, thinking about making some personal changes lately. Been feeling like I'm stuck in a rut. I wanted to start improving my self-care routine. I've never really done that, okay? The problem was I didn't know where to start, but then I found Hawthorne. Hawthorne is a premium tailored personal care brand that's making it easy for guys to feel and smell your best. This stuff is no joke. It starts with a quiz, okay? They ask you things like, what's your favorite drink? How do you like to spend your night out? Do you smoke, et cetera? How you answer determines which scents and products they're gonna suggest to you. It's really cool. It was fun to reflect on my current lifestyle, which is uh, at the moment staying indoors, but hey, man can dream. The quiz took me about five to 10 minutes, really easy, it was fun. And they gave me some products that I really like. Hawthorne actually hooked me up with their whole uh, lineup, but I really love the face wash and aloe-based face lotion, as well as the cologne here. This is the Hawthorne Play Cologne, and my girlfriend actually really likes it. It's very sweet, it has like a vanilla tone to it almost. Yeah, it smells really good. So I'm really happy with these products. And probably my favorite part about the whole Hawthorne lineup is that it gives you an entire routine for you to start your day. It starts with the body wash and shampoos in the shower. You hop out, you put your lotions on. I am moisturized, all right? It feels great. Once you have that momentum in the morning, it carries out through the rest of your day and you really start to feel great about yourself. The face lotion in particular, I feel, I feel like I'm glowing now. I'm radiating. I am handsome. I feel great, okay? Hawthorne even takes the risks out of it by giving you free shipping on your order or returns. If you don't like your product, they'll even retailer them based on your feedback. That's super cool. I'm keeping my stuff. I think that quiz nailed it for me. So do what I did. Take Hawthorne's quiz today and get started on your personalized self-care routine by going to hawthorne.co and use promo code GAS to get 10% off your first purchase. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O. Promo code GAS. Thank you very much, Hawthorne, for sponsoring this episode and for making me feel great. 1970 marked a shift in the race as it was the first time since 1926 that an Unser family member didn't participate in the race. However, a new generation of family would soon begin racing, with Bobby Unser Jr. entering the race in 1976. The 1970s also saw major changes to the open-wheel division, as low-slung mid-engine cars started to challenge the more upright front-engine sprint cars, which had previously dominated. However, it was the 80s that would see the biggest change in the race since its inception, with the creation of the Rally Division in 1981. The addition of rally would bring a wave of excitement and change to Pikes Peak Hill Climb as Europeans like Martin Schonk, Ari Vatanen, 
and our girl, Michelle Mouton, got involved. In 1984, Michelle placed second in an Audi Sport Quattro S1 with Fabrizia Pons riding shotgun. In 1985, Mouton returned to try and seal the deal, this time driving solo. In her words, it was my WRC car, the short wheelbase Group B Audi S1, but modified. We worked a lot on altitude and electrics. Unlike current drivers, Mouton had no paddle shifters, just manual gear shift. As she recollected, it's what you know, so you just got on with it. And of course, Audi had also introduced all-wheel drive to the Colorado Rockies, forever changing how the course was attacked. Wow, that was the first time an all-wheel drive car? That is nothing to think about, yeah. In Michelle's words, the track was smooth gravel, very wide open. You started at around 1,500 meters above sea level in the forest and reached 4,500 meters in less than 20 kilometers in 12 minutes. So it's quite, yep. (laughs) One time I drove up with all the clouds beneath me and some drivers in open top cars had oxygen masks. I didn't find the altitude a problem. I do awful at high altitudes. I get real bad altitude sickness. Like I went camping one time in uh, in the Sierra Nevadas near Bishop, and like the town is at like eight thousand feet, which was fine, but like our campsite was up at like ninety five hundred, and then we went on, we like went yeah. even higher at like ten thousand, and I was like, I was dying, dude. Did you just get sick, or I've never had alt- altitude sickness. What yeah, just a really bad headache. It's like easier to get dehydrated too. And like just really short of breath, of course, but mostly head- headache was the worst part for sure. One issue that was somewhat surprising for an uphill course was the actual drops in elevation, many of which were near the top of the course. It took drivers a great deal of trust in the downforce of their car to take the down slopes at speed and trust they wouldn't just lift off the track. Of course, Michelle wasn't exactly welcomed by the race's organizers. They fined her for speeding on the practice starts and pulled her in front of a hastily assembled tribunal. Mouton was convinced that they, quote, didn't want me to win, so they find something they believe can be a big penalty. He took the set back in stride and the course by force, setting a blistering all-time track record of 11 minutes, 25 seconds, point three nine. Hell yeah. Das Queen. As the Europeans invaded, it seemed like it was the end of an era for the Unser family. Although his nephew, Al Unser Jr., had won the event in 1983 in a Wazawatki Wells Coyote Chevy. Uncle Bobby, (laughs) as he was known, had retired and was now living in New Mexico. That was until he received a phone call from an unlikely source. Audi. Are you saying howdy? No. Howdy there. <laughs> no. Howdy. No, we are saying alti. Alti. Howdy. Why does he not have a stands me? <laughs> they had built a one-of-a-kind 5,000 CS Quattro and wanted to fly Bobby out to Talladega to set some new records. It was an offer Bobby couldn't refuse to combine their clearly superior car with Bobby's unmatched knowledge of Pikes Peak and break their own record that Michelle had set the previous year, but this time with an Unzer of Unzer's Peak behind the wheel. Bobby couldn't refuse, and Audi flew him to Talladega to test drive a heavily modified, turbocharged 5,000 CS Quattro. Bobby set 16 new closed course records, nearing speeds of 220 miles per hour. In Bobby's words, they tried for three years and spent millions of dollars, never could get their 200 mile per hour record that they wanted. (laughs) I did that on the first run that I did. (laughs) Next, Bobby wanted a chance to drive an Audi at the course he'd made, his Rocky Mountain Playground, big old Pike's Highest Peak. Audi had accomplished German rally driver Walter Roll in mind for Pike's Peak, but Unser had a trick up his sleeve to get his spot. According to Bobby, when I did Talladega, I never signed a release, and there I got them a whole bunch of world records. So I just nicely told him, if you want to advertise Talladega, you're going to have to do Pikes Peak with me. That Walter Roll or, or, or whatever can go next year. That's how I got my ride in the Audi deal. My brother Al tells me I'm crazy. And I say, shut up, Al. Oh, Bobby, you're crazy. <laughs> I know I'm crazy, Al. You're weird. <laughs> Always writing them parody songs. <laughs> Bobby might indeed have been crazy. He hadn't won Pikes Peak since 1968, and he was now 52 years old. 
650 horsepower WRC car he was driving at Pikes was vastly different from the muscle cars he'd driven in multiple victories in the 60s. He was blown away by the turbo boost, which was operated by what he called Lil Dinky <laughs> on and off switch. <laughs> Among other modifications Bobby insisted upon for the all-wheel drive, he demanded that the limited slip differential on the front be removed entirely, enabling one tire to turn independently of the other. Although he was warned it would cause the car to run dangerously hot, Bobby didn't care. And the results spoke for themselves. Bobby drove his Audi Sport Quattro SL straight through Michelle Mouton's 85 record, beating it by nearly 16 seconds with a time of 11 minutes, 9 seconds, 0.22. Audi proudly put out an ad boasting, Bobby Unser climbs 14,000 feet on all fours. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> in 1987, the Audi hot streak continued as Bobby stepped aside to finally give Walter Roll his shot at the course. At first, the accomplished German rally driver struggled. According to Bobby, who is now in a coaching role for the German, Roll was treating Pikes Peak like a rally course. Bobby reminded him the course's constant elevation made it unlike any circuit course and encouraged Roll to watch tape of his previous runs. Apparently, Bobby's advice paid off because Roll managed to shred Bobby's record by nearly 20 seconds now, clocking in at an astounding 10 minutes, 47 seconds. And for context, that was nearly five minutes faster than the first post-World War II record set in 1946 by Louis Unser. In only the past five years, the record had been brought down by nearly a minute. All of this brought up a tantalizing question. Could the 10-minute barrier be broken? Ooh, I think so. Yeah, if there's anything I know about story structure, <laughs> I think we might get there. There were two men who may have been able to answer that question. The first was Nobuhiro Tajima, nicknamed Monster, born in 1950 in Tokyo, Japan. Tajima had been racing on dirt since the 60s in Japan, making his name as part of Suzuki's rally program and competing in the World Rally Championship. However, it was hill climbing where Tajima's aggressive technical style truly shined. Tajima had first learned of Pikes Peak as a young boy growing up in Japan when he was, quote, looking through a magazine and saw a picture of a stock car going flat out across the gravel finish line with a man waving a checkered flag. I thought it looked fantastic. I wanted to race at Pikes Peak ever since. And in 1988, my dream came true. The learning curve was steep, pun intended. The first car Tajima would enter was not a Suzuki, but a Mazda 323 all-wheel drive. The next year, he would drive a modified version of the Suzuki twin-engine Cultus that he drove in the Japanese rally circuit. It featured two 1.6-liter Suzuki G16 engines, one for the front wheels and one for the back, adding up to 800 horsepower as well as all-wheel drive. However, Tajima failed to finish the race. Perhaps like Walter Roll, he was still thinking of Pikes Peak as a rally race and not what it was a one-of-a-kind beast. In fact, yet another member of the Unser family, Bobby Unser's son, Robbie, would win that year, driving a Peugeot 405, becoming the fifth Unser to win the hill climb. But Tajima was taking notes. Like we said, Tajima was only the first of two men with their eye on the 10-minute record. The second was New Zealander Rod Millen. In 1994, Rod brought an 888-horsepower Toyota Celica to Pikes Peak, and set an eye-popping time of 10 minutes and 4 seconds flat, Jeez. breaking the existing record by a full 40 seconds. Wow. Yeah, insane. Millen hadn't quite reached his mark, but he had made it clear that 10 minutes was doable. That's um, something I love is like in, in sim racing, you know, you, before you get in a race, I like to do a lot of practice laps at a certain course if I don't know it very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like the first time you, the first for the first 10 minutes, you might be stuck at like, let's say one minute, six seconds. And you're like, all right, I'm going pretty fast. There's no like, let's just try to get to five into the fives. And then you do. And then once that momentum starts going, you just keep taking that time off. And then you're like, oh, shaving, it, shaving it and shaving like it. a sub. Yeah. Like a sub one minute is possible. And that's what this guy must have been feeling. Yeah. This would yeah. be a good His manscaped integration. We're talking about shaving seconds off. 
Guys, I just want to remind you again about our sponsor for this episode. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Guys, I've talked a lot about male grooming here on Past Gas. Manscaped has been a longtime sponsor of the show. You know what? It's a product that I endorse. I cannot get enough of my lawnmower 3.0 trimmer. And I'll tell you more why, okay? Trimming is scary. You don't want to nick your balls. Luckily, the Manscaped engineering team has perfected the greatest ball hair trimmer of all time, the Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0. The premium Lawnmower 3.0 is waterproof, has an LED light on it, and it's also got advanced skin safe technology, which reduces nicks and cuts on your delicates, which is where you don't want to get cuts or nicks. Don't want them on your delicates. Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Included in the new package is the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer which is waterproof and uses a 9,000 RPM motor fitted to a 360 degree rotary dual blade system. This is also another great product, the Weed Whacker. Definitely check that out if you're interested, if you've got crazy out of control nose and ear hairs in their perfect package 3.0, which also includes the Manscaped Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toning Spray, which are both super practical and smell great too. You wanna keep it smelling good down there, you know what I'm saying? Plus for a limited time when you order the perfect package kit you get two free gifts the shed travel bag and the manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs are very comfortable i will say those boxer briefs have optimal temperature control with their crop cooling technology keeping your pride and joy supported the waistband is also super elastic to reduce chafing and rubbing plus guys when your girl sees this logo she knows you got a real manscaped man that's that's important. Pair those boxer briefs with their pH balancing liquid products like the Crop Preserver and you're ready for anything, guys. Also, you're gonna receive a replaceable blade every three months to keep your weed whacking and lawn mowing time clean and enjoyable. It's awesome. Get 20% off and free shipping with code GAS20 at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. That's 20% off and free shipping with code GAS20 at manscaped.com. Um, and yeah, it really actually helps the show out when you guys order stuff with our code, so please do that. Anyway, thank you, Manscaped, so much for sponsoring this episode. Now, back to the show. The next year, Tajima responded by winning the race in a Suzuki Escudo, another twin-engine car. But what made the Escudo unique was its aero kit, which included an enormous front splitter, wing, and diffuser trio. It was truly a monster fit for the monster. Still... Tajima didn't get a chance to threaten Millen's newly set record. The course was shortened due to weather, meaning that the times weren't comparable. Side note, 1997 saw Pikes Peak attempting to expand an entirely different class of racing with the Pikes Peak International Raceway opening in 1997. Spencer Penrose was probably doing laps in his grave wishing that he had thought of the idea first. Yeah, it's kind of actually, if he made like a little dirt <coughs> oval at his hotel, that'd be pretty tight. The raceway was part of an oval-shaped economic bubble in track racing, uh, with new tracks opening in Las Vegas, Nashville, and even Walt Disney World. Pikes Peak Raceway was a one-mile D-shaped oval with 10-degree banks. It hosted IndyCar in 1997, with Tony Stewart winning, uh, and later hosted NASCAR Truck and Bush Series events. Then the bubble popped, and in 2005 it closed and was uh, later converted into a club track. Uh, allowing us to return to the action on the mountain. I did not know that Tony Stewart uh, drove IndyCar, so I looked into it, and it turns out he was a champion. Uh, he was an IndyCar champion, and he's also the only man to win both an IndyCar and NASCAR title. Millen's record would actually stand for over a decade, as changes to the course became a bigger story than the evolution of the cars themselves. In August 1998, the Pikes Peak chapter of the Sierra Club filed a lawsuit against Colorado Springs and the National Forest Service claiming that the 1.5 million tons of gravel that had been used to maintain Spencer Penrose's highway over the past 20 years was polluting the environment and the mountain. Notably, the hill climb itself wasn't actually a party in the lawsuit, although it would be the most affected by the proposed changes, and the group that organized the race uh, was formally opposed to the plan to pave the road. Yeah, so in 1999, Colorado Springs and the Sierra Club reached a compromise with the city agreeing to pave the road in sections by 2012. In 2002, the first mile of the race was paved. In 2011, shortly after the 2011 event, the entire road was paved. The consequences of the race meant that there would now be eras for Pikes Peak records, all dirt, 
from 1916 to 2001, a mix of dirt and pavement from 2002 to 2011, and all pavement from 2012 to the present. With that development, Rod Millen's 1994 achievement became even more notable. It now stands as the fastest time anyone will have ever conquered Pikes Peak on dirt. Unfortunately, uh, we won't be able to see if someone could do it faster. In the hybrid dirt and pavement era of 2002 to 2011, it was instead Tajima who dominated as he won the event a dominant six times in a row from 2006 to 2011. Only the second six-time streak in the race's history, the first being Bobby Unser between 1958 and 1963. 2007 was the most notable year of Tajima's streak. Suzuki's car that year was the Suzuki Sport XL7, boasting a monstrous aero kit that made the car almost comically unrecognizable from the midsize SUV it was supposed to be. It was part of the proud tradition of ridiculous hill climb versions of factory cars. Perhaps the best was in 2009 when a Ford Fiesta RX uh, Rallycross, driven by Marcus Grissom, boasted 800 horsepower. Please go to your nearest Ford dealer and ask for the Pikes Peak Fiesta and let us know what happens. I've been looking at Fiesta STs lately. My Mustang has been having a lot of issues. I mean, I've, already, I've driven the Fiesta a few times at autocross, and like, it's just the most fun. It's such a great car. Yeah. And it'd be fun to like do little upgrades to it. Wait, you have to look at this XL7. It doesn't. It doesn't look like an XL7 at all. It looks crazy. Yeah, it's not a midsize SUV. I mean, normally the XL7 is though. That's pretty funny. Dang, that thing's insane, man. All that aero. Yeah. Pushing those tires to the ground. Speaking of aero, Tajima's aero kit had one job and one job only to keep the all-wheel drive Suzuki as firmly pressed onto Pike's mix of pavement and dirt as possible. In <laughs> fact, the Aero provided Najima with 35% more downforce compared to the car he'd driven the previous year. Inside was a twin-turbo, 3.6-liter, variable-valve-timed, 993 brake horsepower engine with a six-speed triple-plate direct clutch. Woo! Wow. That's a fun car. <laughs> yeah. Najima's time was blazingly fast, but it landed in an awkward window. At 10 minutes, 1.408 seconds, oh. it beat Rod Millen's time that he had set back in 1994, but it was still just shy of the 10-minute barrier. 2011 was the last year of the hybrid track. Tajima drove a new Suzuki SX4. It had a 2.7-liter twin-turbo V6 with 885 horsepower this time around, and he knew that it was his last chance to break 10 minutes while there was still at least a little gravel left on Pikes Peak. Whether it was the new car or the weight of the moment, everything lined up for Tajima. Nearly two decades after Rod Millen's 10-minute, four-second run, Tajima finally reached a milestone that, had, that he had been only seconds out of reach for nearly two decades, setting the first-ever sub-10-minute time of 9 minutes, 51 seconds, 0.278. Of course, it came with a giant paved asterisk attached. All but three miles of the course had been paved. It's up to fans to decide which record is most impressive. On one hand, it's hard to argue with Rod Millen doing it all on dirt, but on the other, maybe Tajima could have topped it had he been given a few more years with an unpaved road. I think he could have. In the fully paved era of Pikes Peak, Tajima's sub-10 minute time quickly started to look slow. In the long tradition of sons taking on the mantles of their racing father, the name of note in 2012 the first fully paved edition of Pikes Peak was Reese Millen, the one and only son of Rod. <laughs> He's driving a <laughs> Hyundai Genesis Coupe with a Garrett GTX 3582 turbocharger. The car boasted 700 horsepower and 700 pound feet of torque, which is a perfect horse pork. And without a, having to account for gravel, the wheels were changed over to slicks. Reese set a time of 946.1 demonstrating that there were now attainable barriers to break well below the 10-minute mark. The next year was the biggest relative jump in speed ever witnessed by the mountain. Frenchman Sebastien Loeb piloted an 870-horsepower Peugeot 208 T16 and tore Reese Millen's records to ribbons, setting a new time of 813.8. Now, as much as you might miss the gravel shooting up like waves after every turn, there's also something to be said for watching a man literally rocket up one of the tallest mountains in the world in just over eight minutes. 
Experimentation continued as teams raced to figure out the fastest way to attack the newly paved course. In 2014, the winner was Norma Auto Concept, a French open cockpit Le Mans prototype style car with rear wheel drive. Now that the road was paved, the old rules didn't apply. The next year, a prototype style car again prevailed, but this with a key difference. This time, it was electric. Driven by Reese Millen, the catchily named 2015 Drive EO PP03 was the first <laughs> electric class vehicle to win the race in its 89 year history. Pretty rad. A key advantage to electric cars was that they didn't lose power as oxygen levels thinned at the top of the mountain. Oh, yeah. And it was clearly the beginning of an era and one that actually brings us right up to present day. In 2018, Romain Dumas broke the eight-minute barrier in a 2018 Volkswagen IDR or Eye Doctor, breaking the <laughs> breaking the eight-minute barrier with a time of 757.148. The Jeez. car boasts all-wheel drive with active torque distribution and a lithium-ion battery, powering a dual motor, giving it a combined 507 kilowatts of power, which translates to 680 horsepower. It weighs in at under 2,500 pounds with a 0 to 60 time of 2.25 seconds. We, we only wish Bobby Unser was in his prime to give it a spin. Currently, the eye doctor still holds the fastest time on the mountain, <laughs> but it's nearly assured to fall in the coming years as electric race cars continue to rapidly evolve. Pikes Peak has also evolved into a celebration of all sorts of cars, from van life Mercedes to a rally-bred Bentley. In many ways, the now dominant electric cars fit perfectly with the ethos of the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, which has always been to find the fastest way possible up the mountain, whatever the vehicle. So we're probably approaching the limit of what is humanly possible, but of course, there's always the question of what's beyond humanly possible. Will we one day see an AI-assisted car conquering the mountain? Whatever the changes that may come to the race, it will continue to be a battle of both technology and drivers. And as long as the mountain still stands, we'll race you to the top. Race Ooh. you to the top, boys. <laughs> um, I would like to see Mercedes bring their uh, Formula One car to Pikes Peak after their after this current age of regulations is over. That'd be cool. Yeah, I think they could. I think it could break the record for sure. That thing is like the greatest race car ever. Well, did they just do some promo where it was driving on mountain roads and stuff? I'm not sure. Um, but like Porsche after they won Le Mans with their car, the nine nine one nine, I think. They they developed some new arrow for it and like bumped up the power that would have broken the rules at Le Mans and the WEC and they it was like the 919 Evo I think they called it and they just went around to tracks all over the world and broke all the track records and I think it'd just be so cool if Mercedes could do that with the Formula One car because yeah. they can do it the current car this year is so fast so fast um so fast so slick Pikes Peak. Had a great time today learning about stuff. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm out of breath. These podcasts really take it out of me. Uh, you have COVID. <laughs> oh, no. Nah, I'm just out of shape. Follow follow everyone on the show on all social media. Joji Weber. Fired up. James Pumphrey. Toot toot. Nolan J. Sykes. Go vote next I week. Would, vote yeah. next week. Is that is that next week? You should wow, go vote yeah. next week. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Pikes Peak, Donut Media, be kind. Keep it juiced. Doody, toodly, toot, I love you. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>